So how did you come to Sarah Edwards? What Do you remember the first time you encountered her story? Absolutely. I was a young teenager and I was at a conference and I was powerfully impacted by the preaching. It hit home to my heart in a, in a way that was was very, very direct. And the preacher recommended um, a sermon by Jonathan Edwards called Heaven, A World of Love. And this sermon had been reprinted by the Banner of Truth as a little booklet. And it was only, uh, Ruth, 13 new pence, which at that stage I could afford. <laughs> so I bought this and it described heaven as a world of love um, because God is a God of love. And it just describes it in such a powerful and beautiful way that I thought, wow, I need to read more about Jonathan Edwards. And that's when I began uh, reading more of his works, thinking about him. And of course, I very quickly came upon what you've already alluded to, which is that when they experienced extraordinary revival, uh, Jonathan very much looked to his wife, Sarah, as a visual aid of the love of God and how that worked out in practice in the home in real life. And he described her revival experience in a powerful way, which I came to somewhat later. But then that uh, glory of knowing God in a very personal way and then wanting others to know that love too, that gripped me myself from a young age. So when does her revival, if you like... Um, happen? When does that actually occur? Well, she knows God from a young age as a little girl, and then she's very, very profoundly impacted by the love of God as a teenager, as we read from her own diaries. And at age 17, she married this preacher, became a pastor's wife. Um, and you look at the first uh, number of years as a pastor's wife, and she did love God, but she also had children in very quick succession, as many women did in those days. And her husband said that she often was gripped with fear and anxiety. But then, some years into their ministry, in the year 1742, there was a revival of religion in an extraordinary way, which is when kind of God puts his work, his kingdom work on fast forward and comes in a mighty way. And it was at that point that she was overwhelmed with a sense that whatever happened to her in life, whatever happened to her um, family, whatever happened to her community, uh, God would be with her. Nothing could separate her from the love of God. And the interesting thing is that in the final years of her life, she went through many, many more hardships and traumas uh, than had ever been the case in the first part of her life. But God enabled her to go through those with a sense of serenity and peace and security uh, that meant that she really was if you like, living out a visual aid of the fact that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. It's as if everything was thrown at her to prove to see if that was true. Um, but in fact, that really was true. So I think that's what I found inspiring. We, know, we don't know what's going to face us in life, do we? We don't know what's going to happen later today, tomorrow, let alone next year. But whatever happens, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. So that, that particularly intense experience was 1742 when a revival was impacting their town of Northampton. You'd written a number of biographies. You have written stories of many incredible lies. Have you written about Jonathan as well? No, because so many other people so much better qualified than me have done amazing work on that. I mean, the biggest and most authoritative biography is by George Marston, and I commend that. But the biography I love is by somebody uh, called Ian Murray, and his biography is 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 devotionally very, very powerful. So I, I, I stand in awe of these people who've written about Jonathan, and I haven't really dared write about him myself. <laughs> so I mentioned that you uh, you work with the Christian Institute. Tell us about your work there. So the Christian Institute uh, believes that God is good, his purposes are good, he has created us as human beings, and so the uh, principles laid out in his word are good for all society. And we just simply seek to help Christians to see how the truth of God's word can have a positive impact in the public square and on all the really complicated issues that arrive, arise in, in, in current social policy. We put out lots of helpful briefings. They're all on our website, www.christian.org. Very easy to find. Um, and it helps people to, to see how they as Christians can take an interest in what's going on in our nation and how we can pray for the glory of God in our nation. And ultimately, we want God to be glorified. And that's the same heartbeat that prompted Jonathan and Sarah Edwards. Uh, tell us about some of the other biographies. Did you only 
come to start writing these stories of some of the great heroes of the faith through your work with the Christian Institute, or was that something that you've been doing outside of that work? It was actually much earlier than that. So my husband was a pastor of a church for 26 years, a, a, a wonderful church, very happy in that church. Um, and it was when I was a young pastor's wife with children at home that I found myself hugely encouraged by the testimonies of some of the great uh, women of the past. And the first one that I investigated was the first missionary from America to Asia, a woman called Anne Judson. And when I read about her life and the sufferings that she went through for the sake of Christ and the joy that she found in following God, even through the most immense hardship, I was truly humbled because as a young mother, I sometimes was tempted to self-pity and think, oh, woe is me, my life is so hard with broken nights and sick children and all the rest of it. And her life absolutely inspired me and put me back up on my feet and thought I want other people to read about this woman too so that they can be encouraged. That was my first one. It was as a young pastor's wife wanting to encourage other people with the amazing story of this woman who'd encouraged me. Um, that's the that's the power of story. That's what this whole show is about, actually, and building our faith. When does your own personal revival happen? I mean, you know, you've you've got a story like that, like that woman who encouraged you um, in in her faith and and in writing her story. But do you have you know a moment where you see there's an awakening within you, or is it is it a journey for you? Well, so much a journey, but there are those moments when you experience God in a very real way. And there were moments through childhood when I did, because I had wonderful, wonderful parents who brought me up to know that I'm here on this earth to love God and enjoy him and glorify him. So there were those moments through childhood of sheer beauty and and love for God. And then as a teenager, it deepened, mainly through that reading of that Jonathan Edwards sermon on heaven and a world of love that I mentioned. But then when you leave home, it becomes very much more powerful because you're on your own two feet. You have to stand up for yourself. And then I'd have to say, Ruth, looking back over the decades, it's sometimes been at the, at the hardest, saddest, toughest moments when loved, when, you know, my parents have, have, have passed away and gone to be with the Lord and we had to care for them. The hardest, roughest times is when God comes in with such sweetness and such, such comfort and such assurance. And I have to say that, you know, that the glory of the Christian life as you look back over the decades is those moments when it's punctuated with, with, with God making himself even more real um, in the hard times. Hearing today from Dr. Sharon James, and you can find uh, the Christian Institute that she works for on Christian.org. She's also on Sharon James. Org. hearing today about that brand new resource on delighting in God, the biography of Sarah Edwards. UCB2, the home of hope and worship. Hearing today from Sarah Edwards, uh, author, no, hearing today from Sharon James, there we go, author of the biography of Sarah Edwards, delighting in God. Um, it, you wrote a lot of biographies. You've written a lot of these stories. Why now? Um, why did it take you until now to bring us the story of Sarah Edwards? I think that there are moments in your life where you think this is just the moment where I'm very burdened to get this message out. The lesson that I want people to take from the life of Sarah Edwards is the absolute privilege and joy of knowing and loving God and then wanting everybody on earth to have that same privilege and joy of serving God. And one of the great lessons from her life is that she and her husband were committed to praying for global revival. Her husband wrote an invitation, an, an urgent invitation to pray for world revival. He called for a constant prayer for world revival because they had seen the work of God in their own community and it was powerful. And in their uh, their small nation at that point, um, Massachusetts, which was powerful. But they wanted everyone on earth to know God and to praise God. And uh, that's my heartbeat at the moment. I think that as we look out on the world and all the suffering and, and all the difficulties, uh, we want people to know the comfort and joy of, of, of the presence of God, but also to bring him praise. Uh, so it was at this moment, I just felt I want to, in a sense, do my bit to call people to pray for revival. Um, because they are such a powerful voice and role model and example of uh, praying for that and then seeing God work and act. 
How do you find you, um, Sharon, are able to communicate this? Uh, I mean, you know, it's just, it, it kind of sounds like it oozes out of you. Um, loving God, enjoying God, which I don't know, sometimes I, I find I've got to remind myself to do, actually. Um, <laughs> so thankful for wonderful role models. My parents knew that they are here on this earth to glorify God and enjoy God. And that's the air I breathed as a young person. And I remember when the very first Operation World came out, and my dad was friends with the person who did it. And he was so excited. And we use that every day in our homes, pray for the nations, one nation a day. And that dimmed that principle into me that each day when we get up, you know, we, we're to pray for the nations and, and pray for everybody to have the privilege of knowing and loving God. So I'd say to parents out there, it's a great privilege to pass the glo- glory and joy of God onto the next generation and, and nurture your children in that and your grandchildren in that. And that's just such a blessing and a privilege. And I was blessed with parents who did that for me. Tell us a bit more about what you learned um, of Sarah Edwards. Perhaps some things that were surprising when you decided to write this biography that you didn't know about. She's very human. And as you look at her life as a young mother and as a young pastor's wife, she evidently was. I mean, think of it, having a baby every two years. uh, She had 11 children um, before modern pain relief and with all the dangers of infections. She was anxious. She was fearful. And she's very honest also. As a young pastor's wife, she was very anxious that her husband shouldn't be outshone by anybody else. She didn't want anybody else to have more success than him. And she was worried about what the townspeople thought of her as a pastor's wife. So honest about those sins and struggles. And then at that moment of revival, she was deeply convicted that those things were actually sinful before God to worry and to worry about your reputation and worry about your husband's reputation. So that really spoke to me because we can all be liberated when we are freed from that anxiety about what people are thinking of us, what people are thinking about our husband's reputation, what people are thinking about, you see what I mean? So I think that that was a surprising thing to me, that somebody who lived so long in the past was open about her own sins and failings. And then one could then see how God worked in her life. She'd clearly been praying for holiness and praying to be liberated from those sins. And then God actually enabled her to move forward in that direction. She didn't become sinlessly perfect, but there was such a powerful sense that it only mattered what God thought of her, that in those later years when there was a lot of slander, horrible slander in the town against them it was almost as if god was testing them it was unfounded slander but she was able to say i'll leave that to god i really only mind what god thinks of me Mm. Uh, you mentioned that with jonathan edwards there's so many biographies that have been written about his life um are there other biographies that have been written about sarah edwards that you're aware of indeed there are Yes, there are. Um, there's a, there's quite a well-known book called Uncommon Union, um, which looks at the marriage of, of, um, Jonathan and Sarah Edwards. I, I, I have mixed feelings about that one. But many people have written little standalone, um, chapters on Sarah Edwards. The wife of John Piper, Noel Piper, um, has, has written a chapter on her. So she often appears in, in, if you like, collections of biographies. Mm. Um, but I wanted this, the unique thing about this one is that I actually include a chapter where there's every single word of Jonathan Edwards' own uh, writing down of her testimony of her revival experience. And it's quite long, uh, but I found that so powerfully uh, spiritually encouraging myself. I've put in that entire uh, testimony uh, so that people can read that for themselves. When you when you consider revival and something that you pray for, something that uh, Jonathan and Sarah encouraged us to pray for every day, what do you envision? What do you, you know, what does it look like? What did it look like for Sarah? And I mean, you, you spoke a bit about the impact of that experience on her everyday life. But, you know, when we, when we consider, when you consider revival, what do you, what do you th- imagine? God coming down in power to make real what we know and love already, but these things become even more real to us. And God doesn't always work in extraordinary ways. So I don't think we should go through every day, in a sense, weeping and lamenting that we're not seeing days of great revival. He sometimes works in those extraordinary ways. But at those times, scriptures that we know already become even more powerful and impactful to us. 
truths that we know already become even more powerful. We already know God to be our loving Heavenly Father. That becomes even more intense and real. But I think that the when you look at times of revival in church history, a couple of things stand out. Number one, even God's own people are deeply convicted of their own sin because they want to be pleasing to a holy God. And then that moves forward a sense of God's people become more sanctified which means that they are more energised to go out and serve others in a sacrificial way, and then the work of God grows quickly. So desire for holiness, but also desire for God's glory. And there's also then that impetus to evangelism and mission. So you get the work of mission going forward at a faster speed during times of revival, and then, not surprisingly, more people are converted. But it begins with the work of God in the hearts of God's own people that then energises them to move out and, and witness to, joyfully witness to others. Mm. Hearing today about the biography of Sarah Edwards, Delighting in God, and it's written by Sharon James. Um, I'd love for you to read a little bit of it. Tell us a bit about how you've, what what your heart was in terms of bringing this story to us in the way that you've done that Ruth I don't know what your listeners are going through today some of your listeners might be going through the deepest and most horrific of trials and they might feel their lives are falling apart but what I wanted to bring to the readers is the sense that God is good God is wise we can trust him nothing can separate us from the love of God whatever is happening in our lives today. Now, Sarah Edwards lost her husband in the most tragic and appalling of circumstances at a young age. And when she heard about it, she was far away from him at the time. She wrote a little note to her daughter, Esther, and she simply wrote in this little note, My dear child, what can I say? A holy and good God has covered us with a dark cloud. But the Lord has made me adore his goodness that we had him so long, her husband so long, we had him so long, but my God lives and he has my heart. We are all given over to God, and there I am and love to be. So do you get that? My husband has died, but my God lives, and he has my heart. And whatever happens to us, if we have God, we have everything, because nobody can ever take God away from us, and nobody can ever take us away from God. And we might die, but then we are with God. Nobody can take us away from him. So what do we have to fear? What do we have to be afraid of? Uh, Sharon, I'm interested in your uh, the writing of these biographies of these stories. Where does that come from? Um, you know, this is to research somebody like this as well. You know, you're looking at at lots of history. It's not something you can just Google. This was really more than likely you sitting in a library, or I don't know. You know, how do you find this information? Well, I suppose my passion is that. When we see, we want to know God, but one way that God uses for us to know Him is to see what He has done in the lives of other people. So that's where it becomes really exciting. You can love people, yes, but then you also love seeing God's work in people. And then I was trained as a historian. My, my degrees in history, I became a history teacher. I was a history teacher for quite some years. I then went on to do further studies in theology and church history and then a doctorate. So, I mean, I've been given the great blessing of being able to uh, study, but it's always been with a heartbeat that I want people to know more of God as we see more of his works, his real works in real history through real people. And then we can grow in our faith as we see what God does in the wonderful stories of real people, real stories of God's real work. So how did you tell us a bit more about how you yeah how you found information how you researched Sarah Edwards was it easy to find and you know did you have did you have to start just from a writer's perspective did you have to start with that theme that you wanted to to have to kind of embed the whole no, story. No, the themes come out as you do it. So as I said I'd already begun reading quite a lot about Jonathan Edwards and uh Back in the 1950s, it wasn't easily available, uh, but the Banner of Truth did a marvellous work of reprinting a lot of the works of Jonathan Edwards. And since then, there's been something of an explosion in. You can, you can, you, there is so much material now on Jonathan Edwards and his preached work. Now, in terms of the actual details of Sarah's life, that is much more difficult to um, uncover. So it's something, something of detective work, and you have to find it somewhat through the biography and writings of her husband. 
But in terms of the key central portion, which is her experience of God during that extraordinary revival, we have the richest possible resource, which is her own personal testimony, as dictated to her husband, as written down by him, as written by him, and it was anonymous in her lifetime, but after their deaths, the name came out that this was her experience. And so that was my... I enjoy doing the research, I enjoy doing the study, I enjoy doing the writing, but most of all, I enjoy then reflecting on how that can impact my own lives and the lives of of other people for the good. And she has become one of your top biographies, one of the top stories? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, you know, I am going back over a number of decades now. Um, It's Sarah Edwards and Anne Judson, because both of them have that desire for every person on earth. God has created human beings with the capacity to love him and praise him. And we want every human being on earth, old and young, uh, to know and love and praise God. And Anne Judson went to, went to the other side of the world to proclaim that gospel with her husband. Sarah Edwards stayed in her own little town um, most of her life, but the, their heartbeat was the same. They wanted God to be glorified by all the people that he has made. Um, and I have, I've just been inspired by that. You're hearing today about the life of Sarah Edwards, that new biography by Sharon James is called Sarah Edwards, Delighting in God. This is UCB2, the home of hope and worship. That resource is called Delighting in God, Sarah Edwards' biography, and it's written by Dr. Je- Dr. Sarah, uh, Dr. Sharon James, who's an author. She's a conference speaker. She's also social policy analyst with the Christian Institute. I'm interested in how you actually came to work with the Christian Institute. I mean, you're a, so you're a pastor's wife. You know, you're a teacher. How do you, how do you become aware, firstly, of the, the Christian Institute and then working with them? Well, I remember very vividly when the Christian Institute was set up over 30 years ago. I was so excited to have this organization that was existing to help God's people engage well with public square issues because our faith isn't just private. It has implications for all of life. And so I've often prayed for the staff of the Christian Institute and for the Christian Institute's work. And I was so thrilled. Ten years ago, I started working for them um, full time. And my passion really, Ruth, is um, I'm now a grandmother of six delightful grandchildren. I'm a passionate for, for child protection because so many... Uh, Issues in our society are hitting at childhood and hitting at the innocence of childhood. And if you simply think of how many children nowadays are exposed to pornography, it is truly um, heart-rending. And so I am very, very uh, enthusiastic about the work of the Christian Institute as we seek to help people engage with public policies in ways that benefit all of us, including children and families. Well, tell us about one of the resources that you've produced, the uh, the Student's Guide to Worldview. Yes, many ch- many children and teenagers are being bombarded with messages that tell them that Christianity is toxic, Christianity is bigoted, Christianity is something for the past, we need to leave that behind us. And they're being presented with alternatives that bear bitter fruit, because the lies bear bitter truth and the truth bears good fruit. And so I wrote a bigger book for university students called The Lies We Are Told, The Truth We Must Hold. But then I've jacked down the complexity of that to a much simpler book for suitable for 14 to 18, 19 year olds called Track, um, A Student's Guide to Worldview. And this simply goes through 10 short chapters showing young people that God's plan for the world is really, really good. We can trust it and giving real life stories to prove that. Uh, sounds good. How, how do you stay hopeful, though? Well, I mean, when you work, when this is part of your work, when it's your passion, when it's your drive, sometimes I find myself becoming disheartened and and maybe a little bit like, um, the, you know, uh, Sarah, anxious and fearful for my kids um, and for the society that they're growing up in. They're teenagers now, you know, but how do you remain hopeful and positive because it sounds like not a whole lot can uh, can hold you down Sharon 
<laughs> no. Uh, the future is as bright as the promises of God. The Bible is chock-a-block of the most glorious promises. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Christ is king. He is reigning until all enemies are placed under his feet. And as we look at the terrible evils that are assaulting our children and grandchildren, Christ will defeat all of those evils. The victory is not in doubt. It has been secured at Calvary. And I believe we can pray for revival. We can pray for reformation. We can pray for God to intervene in dark days to do great things. So I am hopeful. Well, you can find her resources online. Uh, you can also check her out on SharonJames.org. Uh, find out more about the Christian Institute and their work on Christian.org. Do pray for them as well. And that new resource by Dr. Jar- uh, Dr. Sharon James is Sarah Edwards, Delighting in God, a Biography.